With the All-Star break approaching here in Season 6, we are going to play what might be our biggest series of the first half, taking on the Texas Rangers, who last episode took over first place in the American League West and are ahead of us by two games. We're trying to set the stage for the second half and the road to the trade deadline at the end of July. This is a really pivotal series, especially if we were to lose it and lose even more ground against the Rangers. We're not going to see them again until mid-August, and we want to see what position we're in as the deadline approaches. I proposed some trade options for us last episode, looking at the Pirates outfielder Ian Happ. And in the top right-hand corner here, I forgot... You can kind of see how teams view themselves. What is their current roster strategy? Some teams are rebuilding, and then some teams are normal. Some teams are in the playoff push. So I'm not going to be taking away players from teams in the playoff push. I think teams that are normal are more borderline, but you've really got to make it worth their time in a trade. And those who are rebuilding, obviously, you can take uh, veterans and whatnot. That's how I kind of approach it here, trying to stay a little bit more realistic with uh, the approach to the overall series. I'm still seeing, you know, a strong push for Vladimir Guerrero Jr. In terms of being traded, I'm not seeing as many stay to uh, stay patient, which has been my approach to this point. Really want to see if the numbers start to climb at all, but it seems that this uh, this level of play has been pretty consistent throughout the first half, and it's good, not great play. We're not going to make any moves here to start the episode. I, I did consider something briefly, which would have been to bring up Robert Poisson, but I really think that the right play here is to let him grind away at AAA and become a, uh, a full-time player maybe next year or at least be on the bench but because he has no options I, I need the roster flexibility he probably would be a better option right now than Royce Lewis but it really just comes down to the options and uh, obviously with Royce this is not a signing that has worked out nine million dollars to really get a replacement level player at this point point. and typically in these situations you know if I'm going to trade a player like Royce Lewis to clear salary, like that's really more of a salary dump at that point, and he's got a one-year contract, so to really do a trade that feels right, including Royce, needs to be like maybe a situation where we also give up a prospect and really make it a little bit like the Brock Osweiler trade when he went to Cleveland attached with a second-round pick. I'm not even sure the Texans got anything back in return in that deal. So that would be uh, one option if we had to make uh, even more room. And we're going to have draft day here in a couple days. So we're going through this Rangers series. We'll have the draft interrupted on Sunday or Saturday, it appears. We're going to kick things off, though. We got Joe Michael against the Rangers. Going to try doing a little experience here. We really focus on one main series for an episode. This is definitely one to try this out with. Rangers 51 and 36. We'll see if we get anything off of Brock Porter. And it's going to be a player lock game here with Joe Michael. We jump on into the bottom of the first inning. Bubba Thompson at the plate. And we're off with Joe Michael at 10 victories here in the season's first half. He is in line to be an all star once again. I believe it would be his third time. And there's the AL playoff predictions down below. It seems that we have the toughest division right now with the Rangers projected to go to 94 wins and us at 93. Really tight, which means these head-to-heads are going to be quite important. They're up two games already playing this series at home. They love to be up four or five games. Popped up into shallow center field, and that's going to be Don making the play. Ooh, first in American League All-Star voting here at first base, Vinny Pasquantino. Michael delivers at the knees, 98. Vinny's got uh, 91 hits. He's been one of their most important players this season. 
That one is slowly rolled to a rise and second out. And then Nathaniel Lowe has been really good throughout the series. 17 homers in the first half, 47 RBIs. Lefty-lefty matchup here. Curveball fouled off. And this one headed to Vargas. A clean sliding stop, and he finishes off the first inning. I think he's been one of our most uh, impressive defenders. Ooh, 399 career homers for Corey Seager. Let's hope he waits till after the All-Star break to hit that milestone. And that one is rolled to the right side. Young pops it up. This heads out to right field, and it's five up, five down. I think the other thing we have to think about now is this, this could actually lead to maybe a move with Guerrero, but if Cabrera ju could just be the right fielder the rest of the year and Carlson platoons and is a defensive replacement, like Cabrera's got really good offense. He might not be elite and this team could use the boost, but uh, like standing pat in the outfield and trying to do something at first is also a choice. But even at the level Vladdy's playing, it is hard to upgrade over that. There are only going to be like four or five players in the league that really makes sense. And a lot of those guys are going to be on contenders like we just saw with Pasquantino. One, two on Carter. Oh, you got to call that. Mountcastle, he was somebody that was suggested. He uh, just flashed on the ticker down below. He's having a worse year than Guerrero. He's been really inefficient. And Michael's going to take care of that one. So Ryan Mountcastle, not somebody I'm considering. I went through outfielders who also have first base eligibility. And I didn't see anybody there that honestly made a lot of sense. Maybe a uh, Lane Thomas. Do you really think Lane Thomas is better than Guerrero the rest of the way? I don't. Shallow or midway deep in center. Another easy play. I'm also thinking about where do we have the depth to trade from now? And I look at our starting rotation and I feel like we need all the pitchers we have in the organization. Especially looking at uh, possible free agents with like Waldachuk. Just needing to keep the guys that we have that we think we can count on. Then, uh, you know, Marco De Silva at third base I like a lot. He's one of our top prospects. There is Manny Reyes, who I think is untouchable right now. Julian Rodriguez at shortstop. Now, we have Trey Sweeney's. That's more of a, a spot you have to at least consider as Michael gets the strikeout. It'll be interesting to see how these next few weeks unfold for us. As Michael is perfect, the first trip through the order. And we got some runs across now. 2-0 Oakland. Bottom of the fourth inning. 34 pitches in. Michael seeming to be in cruise control right now. The 0-1 is just outside. And also really interested if this stays more of a two-team race. Angels are seven games back in third place in the West. And that's a pretty big uh, hole to dig out of when the Rangers and us are as good as we are. Rolled it softly. Covering is Joe. Nice flip by Vladdy. Would I consider a move for a player like Vinny Gomez of the Rockies? That'd be like trading for Mike Trout at, like, 23 years old. He has four years of team control, and he's literally either the first or second best player in the entire franchise that's been drafted. Other than Joe Michael, he's probably the next best guy. We're not making anything happen with Vinny Gomez, and there's no reason the Rockies would want to move off of him. Second battle now of the day with Corey Seager. 399 career home runs. And the wait for 400 continues. Joe Michael, four complete games, leads the American League. He's throwing a lot of innings here. He needs the all-star break more than anybody. Should probably sit that game out. 
All right, a 3-1 count here. He has not walked anybody today. Josh Young swings at a pitch borderline. Strike two. Got to keep this in the zone, I believe. And it's tapped on to Vargas at third. Close call, but the second out. And it's blooped into left. Here's Cruz to finish the fifth. Michael flirting with perfection. 52 pitches in. Welcome to the sixth inning. Fastball's been excellent today. The breaking stuff has been really good. Like every pitch has been an option. All right, a 3-1 counts here. Again, got to throw his best stuff behind in the count. And it's a walk up and in. The perfect game is over. Still no hits for the Rangers. 57 pitches in. Michael delivers. And it's a foul ball down the line. 0-2 on Oliveris. Can go with that sweeper. Ooh, a good one, too. Ground ball on to Vladdy. It is two for the price of one. Uh-oh. Crack to center. Don retreating. Makes the play to finish the inning. That was the best swing the Rangers have had all game. Seventh inning. Still 2-0. Two-thirds of the way there. Michael missing on the first pitch. Hasn't done that often. Right on the corner at 99. One and two. Got him! Low in the zone at 98. It's strikeout. Not going to tell me which one it is. Feels like seven or eight at this point. Here's Pasquantino now. The other thing, too, is at first base, we really would want uh, another righty. So it just really limits the number of ways you can actually upgrade over Guerrero. Really, uh, the best thing you can do is probably use Guerrero to upgrade another spot and just find somebody who can be, you know, obviously more than serviceable at first base, but you're probably not getting the Guerrero impact. Down goes Pasquantino. Couple borderline pitches here, a 2-0 count, and maybe the first of its kind in this game. Bottom of the seventh with two gone. Michael now approaching 80 pitches on the night. Nathaniel Lowe not chasing the curve. He might just be taking everything this at bat. Nope, he chased this one, and after a false step in, Cruz puts it away. Seven innings. No hit for Joe Michael. And now Corey Seager. This is probably one of the most dangerous at-bats we have the rest of the way. 399 homers and strike one. Weekly chopped foul. It's the curveball. And now we got some pitches to work with here. 0-2. Sweeper. Sweeper. Out of the zone. Second attempt is a fastball high, but it's too high. Curveball lined into right, breaking up the no hitter. And that is going to give the Rangers a base runner, their second of the day. I think he'll throw a no hitter eventually, but it's not going to be here. And that gives us Josh Young with nobody out. Count is two and two outside. Full count. Rangers trying to rally. Could be one of their better opportunities. Young looks at a pitch at the letters. Ball four. Two on. Nobody out. And nobody replacing Joe Michael. Evan Carter. He went. 
And he lifts it towards Cruz in left. It's an easy play. Runners have to hold. There we go. Getting that low strike called. And Michael gets him waving at the changeup, a pitch we've not really used much today. Kind of breaking out the element of surprise there. And now after the first two reach, the next two are retired. And the strike zone's getting a bit iffy as the game goes on. Yeah, I don't know what's up with this top edge right now. Throwing four excellent pitches, and the count's two and two. Oliveris. Got him! Soderstrom to first. We're through eight. Michael leads the league in complete games. He would like to pad that lead. Pitch number 100 on the way. And Sam Huff grounds one down the line. Got out in front of that, and usually when you hit that pitch like that, it's going to be an easy bouncer to third. Leadoff man on. Thompson takes outside. Michael's energy starting to get down there. He's got maybe 20 more pitches in him. And it's chopped. That's what you expect out there. Only one with the speedy Thompson speeding down the first base line. So that brings up Vinny Pasquantino, who doesn't have the speed if he puts this on the ground. And he does, but foul. Popped him up. Don in center. And Michael now one out away from his latest shutout. A game where he flirted with perfection. A no-hitter into the eighth inning. And now Nathaniel Lowe will bounce it foul. Should this game continue, Seeger's on deck. And now it's 0-2. Got him! Michael goes the distance in his final start before the All-Star break. As the A's pull to within a game of the Texas Rangers. And have a chance to tie up this division with one more win. Just two hits on the day for Texas, and Michael only allowed four base runners in one of his most dominant showings of the year. Struck out eight, by the way. Excellent day for Joe. Let's look at his analysis. Didn't use the changeup much, nor the sweeper. Focused on the four-seam curve two-seamer. That two-seamer's been getting really good lately. He had two hits given up, and one was not even in the zone. The other one was... A low pitch, and he just lined it over second base. I'd like to point out our only runs in that game were scored on a Vladimir Guerrero two-run homer. So that's score one for Vladdy against the chat. Let's go player lock with him. I was actually going to do this anyway, but it even makes it makes even more sense after he scored the only runs of Joe Michael's latest shutout victory. Game two, a chance to even up this series and ensure that whatever gap there is in this division is going to be two games or less when we hit the break. Although, we should be two games back. It was saying we were already two games back in the previous one, but things get weird when they've played uh, an unequal amount of games. It's already 2 nothing Rangers as Vladdy steps in against Owen White. Just with his tendencies this year to hit these ground balls, I think I really have to sit on stuff that's up in the zone. Even the, the stuff that's more middle has been hard to get under for whatever reason. So if during the break we could get Vladdy to get that launch angle adjusted a couple degrees, I think we'd be just fine. Seven straight wins going into this one for Oakland. Getting hot before the break. Guerrero, bouncer, short. I know we're all tired of seeing those. Hey, we got a 3-2 lead as we step in again here in the third. And a base runner for Guerrero. I wonder if he leads the league in double plays this year. He's got to be close. He's got 14 in the first half. 
That's a lot of rallies ended. And a wheat chopper for the pitcher. Can't get two on it at least. Six to two, and Kyle Muller, our old pal, is on the mound. It's been a while since we've seen him. Delivers right over the middle. So we've had a Fran Mill Reyes homer in this game and a bunch of doubles with Aaron Don getting two RBIs on his. Good team effort to this point. Got a battle here. Eight pitches in. Muller versus Guerrero. Count is two and two. No! It's back to the, the backstop, though, and Guerrero nearly reaches via strikeout. Kind of lulled me to sleep in that at-bat. He threw like seven fastballs in the eight-pitch sequence and then goes 12-6 just out of nowhere. There we go, but it's fouled back. Foul that one off, too. Yeah, it says we're one game back there. The record doesn't really indicate that. I suppose we have the same losses, I believe, but two less victories. So that's technically like two half games, I think, is the, the uneven baseball game math. Guerrero lines it to center field. Base hit. If there's a double play this inning, it will not be Vladdy's fault. Got Soderstrom, who is 3-for-3 three three on the day. 0-2 oh, against Muller. And a wheat chopper. It's going to be the catcher playing it. And then a rise is 2-for-2. Two two. So we got the middle of our order pretty much perfect on the day. And Guerrero gets to third. I knew we could get there. And then it's a D. Oh, 2 and he sends it in the air, shallow right, and the inning is over. We're getting nothing in this game defensively, and now the score is tightening up 7-6. to six. Guerrero into center, his second hit of the day. That's softly popped into shallow, or deep second, I guess. It's infield fly. So Arise will try and bring home that two-run advantage for Penn Murphy. Taylor Hearn, one, two, and it's lined towards right and run down. Hit right at him. So that's going to be it for the top of the ninth, and we do secure the save and victory as we go 7-6 to six over the Rangers. Win streak extended, and now this should be, I believe, the same day as the MLB draft. The game comes first, so we're going to go player lock with you, Sneal Cruz. Feels like he's getting hot at just the right time. The power numbers have surged in the last month or so after a slow start. The average is also a tick higher than it was. And we got to see uh, an awesome three-run homer of his last episode. Let's check out Neil Cruz. Hitting 237. And, uh, you know, his OPS is like 40 points or so lower than Guerrero's, but I feel like their offensive impact this year has been pretty similar. Had an offer in the previous day with three strikeouts, so that'll drop his average out of the 240s, but I think he'll return pretty soon. Oh, wow, the Rockies, they have the first pick in the draft, and they've already done a really good job acquiring talent in this series. I I'm just interested, you know, they're an underdog. They have never won a division title, and who knows when they ever will in the NL West. Cruz on the ground and not a clean play. That means you don't get the out. I'll be cheering for them to make a home run pick, though. And we'll see what we can do. I believe we select 28th this year, the lowest we ever have. If we can just get one good player in the first round and maybe a serviceable player in the second, I think that's probably a victory at this stage of the rebuild. Vargas lifts it, and that could end the inning. As we're already tied at two, we got the bats going early in this game. Three to two, Texas, with Cole Phillips on the mound. 
I did want to get a game in with him. I forgot about that. Deep to the wall, it's Seeger! Number 400! Or maybe 401, it could be. Either way, he has crossed that milestone now and goes oppo, putting the Rangers up even further. And speaking of milestones, down below it's telling us Bryce Harper hit number 500 in his career. So the Rangers trying to get back into first place on their way in this game. Whoa, where are these runs come from? Let's go, it's seven to six. Jack Leiter's in the game. Offense continues to play better now that we've changed up this lineup a little and optimized some things. Also could just be some good regression to the mean after so many guys were underperforming their career averages. Cruz lines it towards right. It's a multi-hit game. 21-2, the Yankees with an onslaught against the Nationals today. Wow. Somebody's ERA is getting busted up for the rest of the year. Ooh. Lighter thought he had him. Yeah, we're going to run here as Vargas hits it to third. We break up a potential double play. Here's Sweeney with the drive. Headed out to deep right field. Back and gone! A two-run homer! Trey Sweeney increases the lead. It's 9-6 Oakland. Oh, and by the way, I did edit Lewis's number to 25, so 23 is back in the hands of Eusneel Cruz. Ten to six. Here we go. And two more base runners in the seventh. Kyle Muller comes out for cleanup again. Wow, Vinny Gomez just hit home runs 21 and 22 for the Rockies. Yeah, over there in Coors, he should be a 40 or 50 home run threat throughout his career. Oh, boy. Right field headed back. Got a chance and stays in the yard. 13 runs for the Oakland Athletics. Andre Palante in the game, and that's hit right at Cruz. So we could be on our way to regaining first place. Either way, there's not going to be a huge Texas lead going into the second half. Cruz with a drive. Left field this time. That one is taken care of. And that could be it for this one as we go bottom nine. 14-6. Palante has thrown 59 pitches. Empty the tank, Andre. Ah, uh, maybe not quite yet. Gonna make ourselves look silly here. A run may score on a, a blunder for you, Sneal Cruz, after I took a false step. It's not an error, at least. And the A's pick up a victory. That's three in a row over Texas. And one of our best win streaks of the first half. A multi-homer day for Miguel Cabrera. Maybe the first of its kind. And Cole Phillips, shout out to him allowing six runs and getting a victory. That happens for you like once every four years. And that means it's time for the 2029 first year player draft. I didn't really talk a lot about the prospects this year. Again, I'm not really sure how realistic it is for these guys to factor into our time in this series. So I kind of glossed over it. Also, we pick so late that it's tougher to prepare for these kinds of drafts. Underway with the uh, Colorado Rockies selecting number one. They've done that before in this series, and their latest number one pick looks to be Brian Downs, who was very high on our board as well. So they add a third baseman who's 20 years old. Usually it's uh, players right out of high school going number one, but in this case, he's got some college experience. And then we're going to come here with the second pick. It's the Arizona Diamondbacks who have regressed significantly this year, and they go with starting pitcher 
Andres Batista, who is uh, a fourth year college player. And finishing out the top three, the picks they make a big deal about here, we got the Blue Jays, who are in the basement of the AL East, going with a starting pitcher, Matt Horner. He's 23. So the best high school players would be available then at four, which is really surprising. So as far as players, we have a lot of scouting data on. The Red Sox took our fourth-ranked player, and they took him at five, Dwayne Whitaker, who has uh, the outfield flexibility. He's a switch hitter, can also play a little second base. So I was really intrigued with him, but didn't expect him to fall for us. So, the top of our board right now shows starting pitcher Derek Nicholson. We only got to 45% on him. I did a lot of weeks of starting pitchers in the East getting scouted, but the percentages just did not go all that high, unfortunately. I did that for a number of weeks. There are some players here I have a bit more data on. Here is Curtis Chapman, whose potential range is on the lower end at 71 to 83 but we have a complete profile on him. And although not much looks like super elite, he could at least be a decent potential player with high stamina, solid hit per nine, and a long-term player to develop. So just checking out how the board falls our way. And it's a lot of players who weren't on our radar to begin with. Emmett Hernandez at third base. We have 65% on him. And the potential range is a lot more intriguing He's just a pure third baseman, but uh, nothing looks to be all that developed right away. He's just out of high school, so he'd be a very long-term player. And now just one uh, pick to wait until we're on the clock. The Giants, Daniel Keller. So we got four minutes to make our selection. Nicholson does have an intriguing potential range at 65 to 91. He throws a uh, pretty good four-seamer slider changeup. He's got a pretty uh, standard arsenal, it looks like. Fastball seems to be his best pitch. And uh, the strikeout stuff isn't all that there yet. You'd like to think it could eventually get there. Home run control is one of his better traits. We've taken a first-round pitcher in this series three times one was uh gregorio uribe last year we went with a starting pitcher in the first round who had 84 potential and i think we could probably use another starting pitcher option here we're gonna go Derek nicholson it's a risky pick but i'm gonna take that risk this also continues our seven year stretch of taking a high school player with our very first selection we have two more picks now in the top 60. I'm hoping we can also make the most out of these picks. I have a couple players in mind. Luckily, we have a competitive balance pick. I'm not exactly sure why we get this one. If that's uh, a qualifying offer player who was signed away or something. I can't remember what that would be for, but I ain't complaining. One player I'm intrigued with here I'd like to get is Julius McNally, who is 41st on our board. He is a high school center fielder who specializes in defense and his speed. Always nice to develop those skill sets throughout the organization, and the potential range has enough intrigue. So we could go Emmett Hernandez. That 94 potential possibility is intriguing. Could McNally make it to our third pick? I think it's less likely to happen. And then I have Curtis Chapman here, who has uh, the complete profile, like I said, so he would still be an option for us, and we're on the clock. Emmett Hernandez, third baseman. Wouldn't hurt to get deeper at that position. One of our top prospects is up here. Actually, we have a couple. We have Marco De Silva and Reggie Rankin. So third base turns into a, a little bit of a log jam there. But the name of the game here is just talent acquisition. Figure it out later. Position depth takes a back seat. We're going to take Emmett Hernandez here and really hope that one of those two other players is there at 58 for us. 
So incomplete profiles getting taken here early, but we're kind of just trying to get the highest potential players there that we can. Hopefully we have a chance to take some players who are more of a, a sure thing with our next pick. And there goes Julius McNally at 45. Considering his draft rank and our rank were so close, I didn't feel good about him falling there. If there was more offensively, I would have probably considered him with our previous pick. The ceiling just seemed a little bit lower. So we're holding out for Chapman to make it there. 40th on our board, 46 big board, probably not likely. So you got to look at your other options then. Ken Espinoza, wide potential gap. We've already taken some incomplete profiles. So can we uh, even that out? Manuel Montoya, 18-year-old reliever who looks really intriguing here, but that's only a 40% scouted. Mariano Escalona does have a complete profile, but he's going to be at the best, probably a high C potential pitcher. But uh, one that could rack up some strikeouts with a five-pitch mix, including a screwball. And Curtis Chapman went to our rivals over in H-Town. So that is uh, the Minnesota-born pitcher off the board. And you got the Bay Area teams here picking back-to-back. -back. The Giants, one ahead of us, will not draft off of our big board there. They did take a player, though, that we discovered who might have been a later option with, like, the last pick. So now in the second round, we got Espinoza, 45%, or Montoya at 40. I think we'll go with Espinoza here. He's top 100 on the big board. Comes in 56 on ours. Just going to trust the board at this point. All right, we're not picking again until 102. The only players here I have in the queue are players who were ranked inside of our top 100 that had some scouting data. So we're going to sim to our next pick. And we do have two options there. And I'm probably going to go with Mariano Escalona. I know he's going to be lower upside, but I always like using these guys in the bullpen if that's an option. He does rack up strikeouts, the screwball offers uh maybe a little bit of value there it's a weird pitch no one throws so we've selected our third pitcher of the draft but now we have some players as well who are outside of our top 100 that we can consider we got dino moda and dino saucedo moda another starting pitcher we could just keep taking them but his strikeout numbers have the chance to be as about as low as they get Still, to the queue he goes. Dino Saucedo is a center fielder switch hitter. Comes in 112 on the board. Has a uh, good defense. Could have some speed as well. So we'll consider him. How about Odell Spoon from the Netherlands? He is a first baseman switch hitter who has some power. Can also play a little second base. Odell Spoon to the board. Well, unfortunately, Dino Saucedo went. We're going to sim to 132. At least one more player was taken. Steve Vogt might have been uh, the one removed from our board there. We've taken a lot of pitchers already. I think I'd like to get us a position player here, and we're going to be selecting Odell Spoon. Still a few players on the board as we drop down to 162 in the fifth round. I don't know if I believe that potential range at all, but he's 65% scouted. We're going to take Sean early, late. And at 192, we still got two players here on the board. Third base was uh, a spot I looked at here quite a bit. Also just looking for guys who have position flexibility. I think I'm probably going to go with Richie Gutierrez, who looks to have a pretty strong arm. So that completes this year's draft, and I'm excited to eventually see these ratings. Back to the baseball now. It's our last game of the first half. We're going to go player lock this time with Logan Gilbert. Trying to keep us in first place here in the American League West. We have won our last nine. We just won every game for an entire week with no off days. 
We've taken the first three from the Rangers. And now Trevor Rogers will face Logan Gilbert. And we got to see Gilbert, I think, have a really good game last episode. Ultimately, he did not win it. Kept him in an inning too long, but I think he still had one of his better outings in an A's uniform. Putting down the bunt is Thompson. He'll return to the box. One and two. Got him. Strike three. Could we be the hottest team in baseball going into the break? If we can win this 10th game in a row, hard to argue against us. The standings have been shuffled quite a bit, and I, I'm thinking there'll probably be some more changes throughout the rest of the year. But we belong in first place. Good to see us here again. A 1-2-3 first for Logan Gilbert, carrying over that dominance we saw last episode. Corey Seager is the latest strikeout victim for Gilbert. Third strikeout comes four outs into the game. Here's Vinny Pasquantino, moved him down in the order. Chopper to the right side. Arise handles this one. Oh, what was that swing? That looks like me on my first swing of the day when I haven't played in like three days. Another strikeout for Gilbert. This is a great episode for pitching. Yo, when did he show up? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. When did they get Manny Machado? What is going on? Manny Machado, he's 79 overall. This is not like top tier Manny Machado. Looks like, I don't know if he was just acquired or if I missed this and he's not an everyday player. Although well, he's played 68 games. That's close to every game. No, it's not. It's not every game in the first half. He's definitely not an everyday guy. Manny Machado hitting 282. First round pick in the 2010 draft, which back in uh, or in our timeline here in this series, that'd be 19 years ago. And he gets the first hit. Oh, come on, man. Strike zones are ridiculous. There we go. Sinker is in there. Not sure what was wrong with the first pitch. If that's a strike. Two and two. Right back to Gilbert. Let's get two. Double play. Wasn't sure we'd convert that one. But a nice job here by Gilbert. He throws it over the umpire, who thankfully ducked in time. And two gone here. It's Kevin Biggio. 30th pitch for Logan. It's a 1-2 count now. And taking inside there, Biggio with a good eye. 2-2. Two, two. Got him! Clipping the outside edge. Through three, we have faced the minimum. Bubba Thompson up here in the fourth. We did score our first run, thankfully. Gilbert, is that playable? Guerrero chases. Oh, he couldn't make the catch. It was right there. Oh, that is hammered to left center. Deep to the gap, and it stays in the yard. But Thompson, with his blazing speed, will hold at second. Guerrero gloves this, and moving up to third is Thompson. There you go. Perfect pitch to low. Trying to pick up a strikeout now. Oh, two, and at the knees. It's the slider for strike three. Six strikeouts for Gilbert, and now Corey Seager. Perfect pitch again. 
Trying to bust the bat with a fastball inside, not biting. Curveball, and he couldn't check it. And the double goes to waste. Foul tip on Seeger. Nice comeback there for Logan Gilbert. Oh, man, he is cooking here in this matchup. Eight strikeouts. And we're only one out into the fifth inning. Just nailing the corners with multiple pitches. Now, I don't often do this, but I think in this game here, I want to start playing the rest of the game from this point. So offense and defense. Usually I stick to either full games or just, you know, my usual experience, but I want to take over the, the full game now. Machado with a good swing. He's maybe been their best hitter today. Had a sharp single. That ball was hit hard, and that's kind of where the bar has been set today. Thompson had the double. We'll say that he's their best performer so far, but we can put Manny in second place. The 2-2. Two -two. Yep, another perfect pitch on the corner, and Guerrero makes the tough play this time. So the A's at 2 nothing, trying to make it 10 straight victories. We'll head into the top of the sixth. And here is Miguel Vargas, who's now hitting 281. Got Trevor Rogers, the lefty on the mound. With the sun here, I wonder if it's going to be a little bit difficult to pick up the ball. Softly grounded on to first, one gone. Good change up there from Rogers. A difficult pitch to do anything with. One and two on Fran Mil Reyes. And that's in the air. Center field. And that's a pretty deep hit for a pitch that was, uh, or a swing that was just late. So part of our two runs we have so far would be a solo homer. Lefty lefty for Tyler Soderstrom, who's done a really good job hitting lefties this year. And he will fly out to wrap up the top half of the sixth. We got to remember back to last episode now. Gilbert is probably good for about 80 pitches. And I think we've seen multiple times things go downhill from that point. So I'm going to keep that in mind as we jump into the bottom half of the sixth. Bottom of the order here for the Rangers. Which means that he'd likely be, you know, crossing that 80 pitch point when they have their best offensive players coming up with a platoon advantage. Sam Huff, 0-2, lined into center, it's Cruz making the play. Biggio on one pitch, and maybe we'll keep that pitch count in a spot where he can go into the seventh against their best hitters again. 67 into this one. Thompson looks at one right down the middle. Man, he has been on the corners all day. Ahead of Thompson, 1-2. Just outside. A full count now. Gilbert, 73rd pitch is swung on and missed. Another strikeout. Wrapping up the sixth inning. We've seen the best of Logan Gilbert these last couple episodes. Into the seventh now. Good numbers on the year for Geloff, a guy we want to keep playing, especially against lefties. 359 average. Against the righties, you can probably afford to sit him every time. Right field. This one will be run down. Didn't get quite close enough to the line. And then it's Guerrero, whose numbers are uh, a tick up today. 269, the OPS closer to 800 than when we began. And he lifts this into center, but only 86 off the bat. That's not going to be it. A base hit finally with two gone off the bat of Dylan Carlson. And that will give a chance to the eight-hitter, Yusniel Cruz. 
bounced it on the second. A good pitch to hit. To the bottom half we go, and Gilbert will stay out there. 73 pitches into his day. Jonathan Hernandez getting ready to face his former team. There it is again. We have to see how many of those he's gotten in this game. It is absurd. The one-two on Baker, just low. Full count again. Trying to reach his Baker, and he does, drawing the walk. Very close pitch. 81 pitches in, it's Nate low. I might want to get a lefty up as well. I, I should have thought about that first. But uh, Lowe is one of those lefties who, for some reason, has higher contact, lower power against them. I don't think that you really get a lefty-lefty advantage against this lineup. All their lefties seem to be pretty uh, balanced hitters. Hard to come by. A big at-bat, though. 2-1 on Lowe. Got it there, top of the zone. The 2-2 two -two now, and Soderstrom recovers. Got him at second, despite the blazing speed. I can't believe he just made that play. That could be one of the biggest plays of the day. That recovery and throw in one motion like that, that's courtesy of maybe the best catcher right now in the game. That's phenomenal. 3-2 now on Nathaniel Lowe. Got him! Strike three! And that leaves Seeger already a strikeout victim twice over. And he can't tie the game. Might be Gilbert's last batter. Not going to see him in the eighth inning. We're only going to make that mistake once in a two-episode span. Seeger fighting off tough pitches, not trying to strike out a third time. 95th pitch. And it's bounced on to Trey Sweeney. Gilbert goes seven. Brilliant again with 10 strikeouts in the process. Now let's see if we can actually get him a victory. It's only a 2-0 game, so we could use a little bit more. And of course, they bring in their lefty to face Sweeney. And I'm not sure. Do we want to try Royce Lewis here? He's got to show some value to this team. We're going to counter. He does have 10 RBIs, like four stolen bases. He's done an okay job against lefties. Someone has to. Line drive center field, and Lewis delivers a leadoff single. And now you get Miguel Cabrera, who's leading off in this game. He's over, though, on the day. And he yanks this one towards left, but it's a routine catch. Oh, they brought in the lefty, and he's got to face Vargas. This could end badly for the Rangers. And it's weakly hit on the ground, and they'll get the inning-ending double play. And we're going to bring in our setup man this year. It's Kendrick Haynes. And he's been pretty great to start the year. Now, his low lights are pretty low. He's given up some untimely home runs. But if we look at the total picture, this is the best he's been in his time as uh, a member of our team. Don't throw it right down the middle, please. Only Joe Michael gets away with that. Strike two on the change. And my favorite pitch to throw with Haynes. The cutter that is smoked to right. One run game. Vinny goes deep. Actually, it feels like my favorite pitch to throw with Haynes is the home run ball. I'm getting tired of this. Like the last two times I've tried to get aggressive with that cutter in two strike counts, it has not worked. We're going to retire that one for a little bit. Jeez. Could have tied the game on that swing. Going slider away here. One, two on Olivares. Checked his swing. 
Change up is lifted deep down the line. Foul by six feet. This is scary. Two and two fouled off. Every pitch here. I am very nervous. Got him. Strike three. Action now in the bullpen. Aaron Ashby getting up. Manny Machado now with one gone. Grounded towards Zach Geloff. Good play. And that leaves Sam Huff. Hendricks has thrown 13. I think this will be his last batter regardless of outcome. I have not thrown a cutter since it went 400 feet to right. 2-1 on Huff. There's a change at the knees. I just don't think challenging up and in is the move. Two and two. Right to Geloff. Gathers and on to the ninth we go. I'd really like some insurance. Fran Mill Reyes leads off the ninth. Got him. Big breaking ball. Strike three. Soderstrom directly to Pasquantino. Two gone now. It's up to Geloff to continue our hitting efforts. He gets a breaking ball. Smash to center and run down. Bottom nine. Here we come. Penn Murphy has been an outstanding pitcher for us in the first half. He should be an all-star. I did change his position to closer, by the way. 25 of 29 or 28 in save opportunities. This is his 29th. Kevin Biggio leads things off. There's a good sinker. 84 miles per hour. Can make you look silly without even touching 90 miles per hour. The fastballs miss badly, though, a couple times. There's a foul on the sink. Got him! Strike three! And now against the righty, that slider is a little bit more of an option. Bubba Thompson dropped in. And at the edge, it's strike two. Lifted towards Carlson. Out number two. Willis Baker, game on the line. Takes low. Clip the edge again. Does such a good job in this bottom third. Couldn't get him to chase. That time he does not. It's three and one. Baker has good speed. Penn Murphy gets him out in front. The count's full. Calling for a slider with the game on the line. Murphy slams the door on the first half as we sweep the Rangers in their house, retake first place, and have won our last 10. What a dominant effort by our A's. It was a slow start, but this is a grind, a long season, and we've only gotten better throughout the year. Every month has been an improvement over the previous. And now we head into the All-Star break. The hottest team in baseball. Also, I didn't want to ruin another victory opportunity for Gilbert with as well as he's been pitching. Here's all the swings and misses they had today. And we hit... The corners a few times, definitely a lot of good pitches today from Logan Gilbert. Got all of his strikeouts without having to use that middle third of the zone. A lot of good stuff, low, not too many dangerous pitches. Just had a really good day. So we've made it to the All-Star break. I just wanted to take a look at who's made it to the Derby this year. 
And none of these players are on the Oakland Athletics. But go Vinny Gomez, I guess. 89 career home runs at age 21. Might be pretty good. So we should expect, obviously, Joe Michael would start the All-Star game for the second consecutive year. Aaron Ashby would be there as the top reliever and Penn Murphy as the top closer. We have the top pitcher in all three categories. Tyler Soderstrom, he might find himself on the bench behind Francisco Alvarez. Arise, third at second base. I don't know if that's quite high enough, but possible. Vargas comes in fifth place in voting. The outfield doesn't show us quite enough love here. Aaron Don, not going to be a two-time All-Star at this stage. And Fran Mil Reyes comes in third at right field. I'm not sure if that's going to get it done. But we have made it to the break. We're in excellent shape winning our last 10, 52 and 37. So we've seen this offense underperform, be below average. But by the halfway point here, not even halfway, it's just convenient to call it halfway. Seventh best batting average. We are now tied for 13th in runs scored. And for home runs, tied for ninth. That is also improving. And that's while having the best ERA in all of baseball. Nobody's allowed less hits or less runs. And record-wise, at 52 victories, that's the most in the American League. The Phillies have 52 in the East over in the National League, but the Dodgers have 55. We have the second best record in baseball. We're tied. Fran Mil Reyes is our home run leader. And then you've got Arise and Vladimir Guerrero. The RBI leader is Tyler Soderstrom. Stolen base leader Aaron Don has 19. Zach Geloff leads us in batting average. But out of our starters, it's back to being Luis Arise. For on base, Miguel Cabrera, 368. Zach Geloff behind him, Vargas Guerrero at 360. We have a lot of pretty good on-base numbers. The slugging is obviously improving, and the guys at the very top are a little bit of a surprise. Obviously, Arise does hit for power now. Cabrera's up there with him. You just expect that, you know, typically it's Reyes and Vladdy that could be our top slugging guys, or even Soderstrom, but that's not the case right now. OPS... That is Cabrera, Arise, Reyes, Vargas over 400. Most doubles, Aaron Dunn, Tyler Soderstrom. Vargas has two triples to lead the team. 14 double plays allowed. I, I want to see if that leads the league. Oh, it does. And there's a gap. War would tell you our most valuable players have been Tyler Soderstrom and Aaron Don, partially because of what they give us defensively. Also, uh, lower strikeout rates on those guys. We got a few guys who are north of 20, which is kind of the danger zone there. Some guys are a lot worse these days. Isolated power, Miguel Cabrera. So, this is kind of like a power efficiency metric. It looks at... I think it's like batting average minus singles or something like that is the uh, the simple math on it. But ISO only cares about extra base hits. And Cabrera has obviously uh, led us in that category with 21 extra base hits in uh, relatively low plate appearances. At bats per home run, Luis Arise and Miguel Cabrera. Cabrera might be our answer in the outfield. The best lefty masher, Zach Geloff, might hold that title right now. For homers against lefties, it's Reyes and Soderstrom. And we've got our fantastic pitchers, Aaron Ashby. Nine wins out of the bullpen. Joe Michael is 11-3 and three on the season. He holds one of our best ERAs, but we've got a number of pitchers that have been phenomenal, and Andre Pallante is one of them. Not a one-year wonder it's appearing. Two relievers with a sub 1.0 whip. Haynes, though, 34 innings. He's given up how many homers? Eight. If he has one weakness, it's the home run ball. It's his only problem. 
the advanced numbers are kind of uh, not liking Kendrick Haynes right now. The surface numbers, just ERA, WHIP, those look good. The advanced numbers signal there's some trouble ahead. Aaron Ashby, Penn Murphy, Joe Michael, Logan Gilbert, our top uh, invested players, basically, a number one pick and three free agent additions have been uh, our best when it comes to FIP. We also have Henry Vasquez, who's still holding on to this starting role. Gotta love where the team is at right now. 52 and 37 is a great place for us to be. That's it for the first half, everybody. We approach the trade deadline and the rest of July next episode, and we'll see if there are any moves coming up for the Oakland A's. Y'all have a great day. Please leave a like, leave your feedback, and subscribe, and I'll catch you in the next one. Have a great day.